All right. Hi, everyone. Our next talk is by Marcus Adams, who is an Associate Director of Engineering at Merck. His interests include effective digital visualization, reproducible research and analysis, and convincing his coworkers of the diverse, flourishing world beyond Microsoft Excel. Today, he's going to be talking about deploying a GPX Shiny application. Thank you. Uh, Sid, uh, my name is Marcus Adams. Uh, so I, I do work for the pharmaceutical company Merck. Uh, not just, you know, a lot of people think pharma, you think research, but I actually work in our manufacturing division. So we don't just create the, you know, research the drugs, we also make them as well. And, and I realize there's a few differences between medicine and pharma. Uh, apparently in medicine, it's not uncommon to call conferences meetings, uh, which is confusing to me because that means I attended 15 conferences this week, uh, and that would be uh, a lot. Um, but I, I think there's uh, plenty of similarities uh, between us, especially when we're talking at our conference in Shiny Development. Uh, so within the manufacturing division, I actually work in the end-to-end -end technical operations, digital and data COE, which is, of course, a lot of words. Um, but I'll explain it in a different way with help from our mascot, Rex, here. Um, like our prehistoric friend, and many things for him, uh, we were finding that the data was just out of reach for a lot of our engineers and scientists. So day-to-day, uh, -day, a lot of what we do is try to get it in their hands and make them happy and make them much more productive. Um, the idea, you know, I've heard a lot of talks uh, over the last two days, uh, really is about getting the right data to the right person at the right time. And so in that spirit, I I'm going to show you probably the world's most boring shiny app, um, but it is an app that is in production. So we have this here, we have this great search box, we're going to paste in our search, could have uploaded from a file if we felt fancy. Uh, we're going to lock it and check the syntax, um, and then we click, and there's a lot of waiting here, right? Progress bar. You know, I'd sing, but in the spirit of medicine, you know, first do no harm. Uh, I won't, we'll just wait patiently. And then once it's done, we click and open up our PDF. It's right there. We have our table of contents. We have some process control charts, um, some summary statistics, um, then a histogram. And uh, it's kind of boring, I get it. Uh, it's kind of like finding out when your uh, child's gonna go to a state school for college. Um, you're a little disappointed at first, it's not Ivy League, but uh, you remember what's important. Um, that you know got accepted, and it's about to save you a lot of money. And so for us, um, these are reports that we're having to run quarterly for every manufacturing line that we have in our global manufacturing network. So this saves us tens of thousands of hours, um, which translates to millions of dollars in productivity. Um, and more importantly, um, for our engineers uh, and scientists, they can spend those tens of thousands of hours doing something much more productive than running ggplot code themselves. Um, and really, it's what our sites needed, um, this is exactly what they told us. They, they don't want to be a part of these fancy machine learning, their term, not mine, um, until they can actually get off these rote reporting details. Um, things like CPV, which is exactly what you just saw. It's called Continuous Process Verification Report. Um, it is a GMP report, which if you're not familiar with that, that means it's a good manufacturing practices that it adheres to. Um, basically, a lot of regulations that we have to go through to make sure it's you know, up to snuff and it's rigorous. Um, we will put this in front of regulatory agencies. We will make release decisions off of this. Um, and most importantly, these decisions could have the potential to impact patients around the world. Um, so we have to do a lot of our due diligence. And when so we think about having an app that supports all this, it's in production. And it's in production um, with a lot more around it. Uh, it. It's much more than just that core functionality of creating those automated reports. You know, that, that's our markdown one-on-one, -on -one, but there's a lot more to it. Um, and, and I think about this from the perspective of the classic um, computer science textbook uh, by Fred Brooks, uh, Brooks, the mythical man monk. And he kind of breaks out software into these four quadrants. Um, you know, in the down lower right-hand corner of programming systems product, that's what we're going to call production. But in the upper left-hand corner, you have a program. That, that is what he says you crank out in a weekend in your garage. But uh, this is 2021, so no one does that in the garage. I guess the equivalent would probably be you know, what you crank out in your basement over the weekend with six two-liter bottles of Code Red, uh, right? And, um, but if you want to develop that, right, that's a seed of a software in a production application. So you move to the right, you're becoming a programming system. You integrate it with databases. You integrate it with Epic, if you're unfortunate, apparently. Um, you integrate it with clinical database and registries. Um, and that's three times as much work. And then if you want to make it a programming product, you start testing your code, you generalize your code, you document your code. 
that's going to increase your work by 3x as well. And so by the time you get this production app, it's nine times the amount of work it took you to create just that kernel of what your app is based around. And that means, I'm sure we all can do the math here, only one ninth of your app is the fancy recurrent neural network. The other 89% is what it takes to create a reliable, secure, and maintainable production app. And for me, I don't come from a computer application development computer science background. Uh, I'm a chemical engineer by training. And so really thinking about it in this way is something that was unfamiliar until I joined this project and we went down this road. Um, and I take great solace in the fact that I'm not alone in that. Um, a Birch work study in 2019 found that only about 21% of data scientists come from a computer science background. Um, the rest of us uh, come from statistics, business, engineering, natural sciences, medicine. Um, and so for me, I really had to you know, think about changing an app into a production app. Uh, you had to really change the way I thought about it. Uh, there was so much more and expand my thinking. Um, I didn't really think about production considerations before. Uh, I just thought about a lot about features and what it could do. And so that's what I want to share for you with you the rest of today is kind of how I had to approach it and change my thinking to get to that production app. And so part of that is just understanding this concept of a production and what is production. And I think Joe Ching, uh, the CTO of our studio, said it really well in a 2019 uh, keynote. I uh, said production is software environments that are used and relied on by real users with real consequences if things go wrong. This is not your proof of concept. This is not your prototype. This is not your sandbox where, oh, it's a nice to have. That's really cool. People build their work day around this. They come to rely on it day in and day out. It has real outcomes in the real world. And so to be able to do that, it's much more than your code. Um, it's a production environment. It's not just your code in there alone. Um, and I know there's a lot there, um, but, but it can be done. It's been done before in many different ways. Um, you know, I'm just one of many examples. And so this idea of production environment, of course, implies that there may be other environments. Um, and you may have more or less, uh, right? You may have a QC, you may just have a test and prod. Um, the idea is you separate your environments and based on your requirements. And as you move from your left to right in this development to production environments, it become more stable, it becomes more tested, um, it becomes more controlled. Um, you know, I almost think about it now is there's not really production apps, there's only apps in a production environment. Um, and it's kind of evolves and it becomes much more rigorous. And it's really the requirements that you need to satisfy to get into each of these environments um, and put something out there. And you have to define those requirements. I can't do that for you. Um, there's a lot of talks, great talks out there, workshops out there that talk about a lot of how to scale it up, but there's a lot of other requirements. And you know, for your production environment, um, maybe you have minimal requirements and maybe you have low expectations like eating American chocolate. Um, or maybe you're putting out something that's for a regulatory app like us. Um, so you have to have things like audit trails. You have to have timeouts. You have to have strict change control. It's something you have to define. And, you know, one thing I've learned is your production is not going to be the same as Merck's production. Um, my production at Merck's not even going to be the same as other apps at Merck. Um, and I'm going to venture that nobody in the audience right now is going to have the same as a Google production. Um, you know, I mean, I guess somebody out there works for Verily, work at their health, maybe. Um, but, you know, I'm, I didn't have a million concurrent users. Um, it, it's great that Shiny has been shown to scale up to 10,000 concurrent users, um, but I might have 100 users, and I guarantee you they're not all concurrent. Um, it, it's very different when you're writing an application for internal facing users versus out to the public. Um, you have a much controlled environment, and so that's where you have to move away from these abstract requirements into the specifics. Uh, you, you know, there's a lot of debate about can Shiny you know, support production, can R support production? Um, and you're never going to win that argument until you get to the specifics, and then you can start addressing those specific concerns and specific requirements you need to satisfy to move into a production environment. And to give you an example of one of the challenges we faced. Um, so we had our three environments. Um, we had three service accounts. We had three databases and three passwords, um, right? So you know, depending on where that app was, it had to access different data sets and behave a little bit differently. Um, but our global enterprise security requirements say that we can't store passwords unencrypted in plain, plain text at rest. Um, and I'll say that credentials and secret management, deep topic, I'm not an expert on it. Uh, to quote someone much more, you know, much smarter than I am, uh, it's turtles all the way down, but you know, I'll say this is how we addressed it um, for us in, in our specific environment. Now, when a shiny, uh, makes a request. Uh, so when your user goes to that URL, you have that subdomain. So for us, it was something like cpb-dev.merk.com, uh, cpb-merk.com, you know, cpd com. And so based on that subdomain, we can actually determine what environment we should be operating in. 
Um, and this is great if you're behind a load balancer because you don't have to realize what that server is actually environment serving. It comes from the URL. And so from that, we use the config package um, and we can actually retrieve the appropriate account ID, the appropriate database and the appropriate secret name. Um, and with that, we can go to the vault we created using the secrets package, um, use the server's private key to unencrypt that password and then go retrieve the data. And because there's this asymmetric cryptography, the public key cryptography, um, we can actually encrypt it, uh, commit it to our Git version control. Um, and then with a pull request, we can actually then you know, trigger that as a deployment and rotate our passwords very easily. And you can actually this least privileges. Um, less people have to know what that password is. We're not sending it around in IMs. We're not sending it around in emails. Um, it's just done through that pull request. And so there's a lot of requirements and um, this is just one of them. And so you'll find that as you build out these requirements, you're gonna need help. Um, this was different to the team that I work with, right? Um, there's nine X to work. You're not gonna probably do it alone. Um, you know, just here, I listened to these talks, a lot of clever people out there and Brian Kerrigan, he, he says, you know, he wrote the first book on C programming language. So he probably knows something and if you listen to his advice, probably a lot of people out there are gonna need help debugging their code, if nothing else. Um, you know, so you're gonna need at least one other person. Um, you know, for me and my past experience, I've been doing a lot of this app development just kind of on my own, solo. Um, but all of a sudden when we're working on this CPV production app, we had an entire team under this umbrella of working on this app. Uh, I, I couldn't even put this presentation together by myself. I had to go out and talk to different people to pull some screenshots and data and everything like that. It, it is truly a team effort. And your team may change in size and um, hopefully given COVID, you know, you're not all standing this close underneath the umbrella. Um, but for us, when we did this project starting pre-COVID, so we didn't have social distancing. Um, but the idea is you're gonna need help. Um, most of them probably aren't even gonna be developers. Uh, you have people who do user acceptance testing. Um, you're gonna talk to your domain experts. You're gonna have your end users. Um, they're all part of this, quality checks. Um, they're gonna be a part of this big team. And so even just that small piece of the developers, we probably had about six of us uh, for that first pass um, really have to change your coding habits. And I like to think that I'm a pretty decent coder, even for you know future Marcus, um, but really wanna think about cleaning up your code and be a little bit more formal with it. Um, you know, it's kind of like when you return to the office after being away and re working remote, you're gonna clean up, you're gonna put on real pants. Um, you know, if you're really ambitious, you're gonna shave. Um, so you just kind of have to remember that golden rule of coding. And that's, you know, there's a lot to that, but to talk about three of them, I'm just gonna say, first of all, ha have Git. You have to have some kind of version control. That is a non-starter. Um, because if you're gonna go demo your app, I guarantee you five minutes before that, somebody is gonna save to the file and they are going to break your demo. Um, and a part of that is also having this Git flow that doesn't really get talked a lot about. Um, you might see in Git, you might see in GitHub if you go out to our packages, the maintainers, I mean, you'll see the Git, um, but having some kind of Git flow where for us, we have a master branch. That's what's gets, it's getting deployed. Our development is kind of this, what we're testing. And those, when we're developing the features, they may not work. Um, there, we use Git flow, there's others out there. You gotta figure out what works for you, but have something so you can control how your program comes together. Um, Document, I think this is something we all know we should do, but even doubly so for production. Um, our Roxygen makes it really easy to do this. You add comments right by your functions. It'll generate the markdown. Um, it's right there. Um, tests are also your documentation. They're also great for making sure your code works as you make changes. Uh, you know, there's unit testing, such as test that and tiny test, but there's also things like UI testing, uh, shiny tests. There's load testing, shiny load testing, um, and user acceptance testing. And this is all to make sure as you're making changes and you're iterating your application, you're not breaking your previous work. Um, and, and I can tell you this has been essential for us to make updates and uh, improvements to the application. And then lastly, because you're working on the team, you really have to divide and conquer your code. Uh, there's a lot there. And R is a functional programming language. And now while a lot of people coming from object-oriented programming may think that's weird and strange, it actually lends itself out very well to this division of labor. Um, you know, you create your packages and your modules. And just, you know, you can send it off and kind of create these modules and not just one big monolithic uh, 60,000 line script uh, file that says run, right? Um, and, and that for us was very critical to our architecture, uh, pushed that very heavily. Um, at the top level, we have our application, it's on the left here. Um, and so below that, we had a bunch of packages, um, you know, some of the normal suspects, you know, dplyr, et cetera. Um, but we also created four internal packages. We had our Mantis DBC that connected to our data lake uh, Mantis is our data lake uh, for the manufacturing division. We had our CPV reporter that 
kind of did a lot of the R markdown, the compiling. We had the accelerator, which exported the, the raw data so people could do other analysis. And then PPXQC was kind of our workhorse. It did a lot of the statistical process controls. It did the charting. It did the run rules for us. Um, and so because it's all modular, uh, you can just, when it breaks, it's one point to fix it. Um, and I've moved off this project mostly as much as anyone can move off a project and still stay at the same company. Um, I've been told by our now business owners and our technical owners for this application that this has been key for moving when we started with version 1.0, we're now getting ready to release 4.0. Um, and the beauty of this in, on even further than that is that it's actually put in this effort, you can actually reuse it. And so this Mantis DPC package connecting to our, our data lake, we actually distributed that out to hundreds of our users um, at Merck. Um, and so now they don't have to know things about JDBC and connection strings, and it makes it a lot easier. And so, you know, might not have the much savings, but I can tell you that probably just as many users for the app as it uses this package as well. And so this idea of, you know, modular modules and packages um, really hit on my last point here and that, you know, this idea that you're going to build it up. It's not one and done. Um, and you kind of iterate on this as well. So this idea that you're going to put out, you know, your application on a DVD and have civilization too, and you're going to ship it and be done with it, that's an antiquated model. Uh, really we move toward this software as a subscription model, right? Your apps get updated. I think there was a presentation yesterday talked about the wonders of web applications. It's always up to date because you can make updates um, and you have a chance to add to it later. Um, but what you really have to do is think about it as a life cycle. Um, you know, a lot of people get to this plan through deploy and they stop and they break the chain, um, but it has to go out in the wild. Um, and, you know, as a life cycle, that also means at some point you have to think about retiring it. Uh, but really remember those links in the chain with that operation. You can't just toss it over the fence. Somebody has to maintain it. Somebody has to do the hot fixes. Um, there's a piece of the product management of it. Uh, people have to, users have to be trained on it. They have to be, understand the documentation. Uh, you have to advertise. In a large organization like Merck, you can't take it for granted. That people just know it's there. Um, and then as part of the cycle for your next planning cycle, you have to collect feedback. You have to solicit feedback. Um, and by, you know, not having all the features out at once, you can build on your success. And I can tell you that, you know, you build something small and useful, you'll get a lot more funding, you'll get more sponsorship to do the next generation. And you'll leave your uh, users wanting more and that will get them engaged um, because you'll be surprised how quickly everything becomes normal. Um, they'll, they'll figure out, oh, this is the status quo and they want more. Uh, and, and to that point, you just, I, I feel almost guilty showing that demo earlier because it really doesn't give justice to this current state. Um, we started out with this version 1.0 with the basic input and we were ruthlessly prioritizing these features. So we got done with 1.0, we already had features that were coming out in the next two releases. Um, and so with version two, we brought in uh, some people who much better at UI design than us. Um, we added this live preview, this data verification report. Uh, 2.1, we brought in in-app help, added some statistical transforms from customization on precision. Uh, 3.0, we actually moved our entire backend architecture. Um, just our data lake in general, I'd mentioned Mantis earlier, that switched architectures, um, as well as we move from Shiny Server Pro to RStudio Connect. Um, and we're very close to releasing 4.0 now. And we've added data sources, um, new graphical user interface. We've been pulling qualitative data, not just the quantitative data. Um, we actually have an in-app query builder. So really looking back at that demo, you remember I pasted a search. Um, you can actually build that interactively. And this didn't happen all at once. It happened, uh, you know, in chunks. It, it evolved over three years. It didn't have just one big splash. Um, and so kind of look back and, you know, we've come a long way and it's really great and rewarding to look back. And I know this isn't Neverland, um, but, you know, you take, take a view from a top of a mountain. Uh, it's a great view, but it takes some effort to get up there, especially this is Mount Katahdin at the end of the Appalachian Trail. It takes work, um, very analysis production app. Um, it takes effort, it took effort to learn things I didn't know. Uh, it took effort to do a lot of this work behind the scenes. It's not that core functionality that all the users see took effort, and I think we all know, to work with others. I'm not saying my colleagues are difficult, it's just there's a lot of coordination there. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll say from experience, all this effort, it's worth it. Um, to go back to that definition of production, um, it's worth it to see others use and rely on what you've created. Uh, and with that, I'll just leave you with a quote from one of my favorite fictional doctors uh, who said, you know, there are no magical fixes because nothing in this world that's worth having come, comes easy. And uh, putting in production app, I'm not going to lie, it's, it's not necessarily easy, but uh, it is definitely worth it. So thank you. Great. Thanks, Marcus.